Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. It is episode 96 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am here with my co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, Salaikum, everybody. Salaikum, Salaam. How are you, Omar? How's it going, man? How, how are things hanging in, in Washington State? <laughs> things are good. It's been a while since uh, since we've we've chatted, really, uh, other than the show. So it's, <laughs> we're definitely, we're definitely due, to, due for catching up. But things are good. I'm up here in uh, Spokane. Uh, yeah, our, our, our listeners don't realize like like this show affords us uh, not only an opportunity to talk to our guests, but it also gives us a chance to for you and I to catch up. So. <laughs> that's right. It, for she, it's a forcing you. function. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Especially with you not being um, local anymore. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah. Um, yeah, still up here in Spokane for the pretty much the rest of the summer while the hopefully the contractors finish the house on the housework. The, that's right. You've mentioned, on, you've mentioned on the show before you're, you've got some renovations going on, uh, pretty extensive, and so you and the family are with your folks in uh, in Washington. Yeah, yeah, just uh, uh, you know enjoying the the, the quarantine uh, with with the folks, which is kind of nice. yeah, yeah. How are you mean, doing? I guess, I guess now with the, well, I mean now with schools sort of indefinitely, you know, starting in the fall with kind of an indefinite uh, remote, uh, what is it, distant learning kind of approach. Uh, I guess there's no need for you to be local uh, un- until the house is done. Yeah, I mean, in that sense, it kind of worked out. I mean, the kids are missing school, and my, my wife definitely wants to be uh, back in the house as soon as it's done. Okay. But, but it kind of worked out in the sense that, you know, the contractor gets to do his thing, and we, I get to spend some time with my parents. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Speaking of your folks, I mean, I, I think it's, we've mentioned this on the show. Your dad is a professor at Gonzaga. Um, how's that going for him, like uh, this whole distant learning thing that he's got to do and learn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's trying to learn Zoom. He's trying to learn Zoom. I told him don't don't be uh don't be uh, uh you know discouraged because uh, you moved from a you moved from a blackboard to a whiteboard in the eighties and you can you can move from a, a whiteboard to Zoom now. That's a good one, man. He's having to learn one more skill. Um Yeah, so uh no uh, yeah, everything's great right here. Uh we had a we had a wonderful conversation last time with uh Mahmoud of the Rove. I know it was certainly a wish list item for you and for mm-hmm. me um you know i i think in hindsight or just kind of the way the conversation ended or um we uh there, there, were, there were certain things that i really wanted to spend more time on which we weren't able to and uh conversely and i guess more of a positive thing we spent things we we spent a lot of time on things that i think either he hasn't discussed previously at least in interviews and things that i've heard which is a lot of his sort of early childhood, his struggles with uh, with, with Tourette's early on, and uh, yes, <laughs> sorry, that no, was my uh, Adhan uh, going off on my app. So, uh, oh yeah, it's, it's Usher time almost. We're, we're here recording <laughs> on a Monday afternoon, uh, but yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. What, what, what did you think? I, I know for you, he was way more of a kind of a bu- like bucket list item than for myself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we could have talked to him for for hours and hours. I'd love to have him back. Um, I'm interested in. I'm going to be interested in hearing uh, or reading the book that he teased, right? His autobiography. So that's one of those things. I mean, we're, we're. I think it's one of those episodes where we're we're going to always want more time. Um, and there's only so much time you can get with these guys who are super busy. But it was cool. It was fun. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, well, we are super excited and delighted uh, to be joined. This episode uh, with uh, Professor Mohammed Fadl, who is a professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. Um, he wrote his, uh, I'm sorry, he received his PhD uh, in Islamic studies with a focus on medieval Islamic law at the University of Chicago, uh, and also received his uh, law degree, his JD from the University of Virginia. Uh, professor Fadl was admitted to practice um, in the state of New York. And he practiced law with the uh, very prestigious firm of Sullivan and Cromwell, where he focused his practice on corporate finance transactions and securities-related 
regulatory investigations. Um, I've been wanting to have Professor Fogel back on the show. We had him early on, um, I think somewhere in our thirties. I think it was. It was actually. I actually went back and listened to it uh, last week. It was um, February twenty sixth, two thousand sixteen. So early in the last election cycle. It was actually. A, it was actually a really, really interesting episode to go back, uh, having now where we are, right? And uh, right. I'm, really, I'm really looking forward to kind of picking up that discussion. Yeah, like, 2020 so, version. I agree, and and we can certainly pick up the conversation. You know, we, we certainly want to pick up the conversation talking about the uh, upcoming election now, four years later. But uh, uh, more importantly, and I guess from my kind of legal eagle kind of uh, brain, uh, I really wanted to pick Dr. Fogel's brain about. Um, um, his thoughts on some of the more recent Supreme Court decisions that came out uh, of this session that just ended um, uh, back in July. So um, anyway, um, we are really de delighted to have Professor Vogel on. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, let's do it. Bismillah. All right. Welcome, Professor Fadl. Uh, really happy to have you on. Um, I know you've been on the show in the past uh, prior to when I joined when we had a different co-host, but I did over the weekend uh, pull up that episode. I think it was episode 33 or 34 from uh, summer 2016, and I listened to it just to kind of catch up and hear a little about uh, your your background and your points of view. It was, it was, a, it was super interesting. Uh, it kind of got me thinking of of all the craziness that's, that's happened since 2016, right? Uh, life has been crazy in general since maybe 9-11, you could say. But uh, we've kicked it into high gear since the Trump election, and and now, of course, everything that's going at, going on with the virus at a macro level. But uh, it's like I said, it's been a crazy year, and you explained the rise of Trump through economics, uh, and that really that really resonated with me. You were talking about how things have gotten global and whatnot, and because there's more supply and demand, you talked about. More, more, more supply of workers, maybe flat or left or, or, or lower demand of, 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 uh, of jobs and, and capital potentially for the for the lower class. Um, things have only gotten worse, right? So, do you see do you see that that pattern continuing and potentially leading to more and more extremism, or are you are you hopeful? Well, I mean, COVID has changed a lot of things. So, I mean. So let me back up. I guess Trump from the beginning began to try to reorient American trade policies, began imposing lots of openly protectionist measures. Um, and then COVID kind of accelerated that. And layer on top of that, a certain kind of anti-Chinese sentiment that um, COVID has reinforced that was already pre-existing. Um, and so now you have a situation where there's a kind of broad consensus among the political class that something has to be done about China. Um, now, it's not clear what that will mean in terms of global trade because uh, the global trading system is highly dependent on Chinese participation. But as you know, you know, just in the last few months, you know, Trump has been... Um, ratcheting up the pressure on China. I mean, right now we're closing consulates and imposing greater and greater sanctions on Chinese tech firms, etc. Uh, there's greater confrontations with China in the, in the South uh, China Sea, among other things. Um, and then COVID has caused a lot of people to think maybe we need to bring back a lot of production of things back to the United States. Now, I don't know how realistic that ambition is, particularly if it's more than for a few products that might be viewed as critical in a public health emergency. Um, but the general point that I, I made in 2016, I think about global economics remains the case today, that um, globalization is of a great benefit on, in the aggregate to the United States, particularly the United States. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of losers from globalization. Um, the Trump response to that has been to try to engage in protectionism and in, 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 in a certain sense, kind of change the terms of trade in a way that's slanted to the benefit of the United States um, by imposing tariffs on trading partners. Now, the United States can get away with that to a certain extent because the United States has such a leading role in the global economy 
no country, no company wants to be excluded from the U.S. market. So they are kind of willing to go along, and there's very limited steps that they can take in the short term to retaliate against the U.S. The problem is, you know, over the medium and the long term, um, if the United States wants to take that approach to global trade, it's likely that it's going to uh, produce reactions, right? Um, you might see a rise of a different kind of trading block centered around China, for example, centered around Europe, right, in which um, other countries enter into preferential trading relationships with each other uh, to protect themselves against the United States. You also see this going on with the role of the dollar. The United States has been very aggressive in using the, role, the, the global role of the dollar as the world's reserve currency to impose sanctions willy-nilly all over, all over the world, thereby effectively uh, telling the rest of the world that um, if you want to trade with us, you're going to have to adopt our sanctions regimes, right? Um, and so even places like the EU are trying to build out uh, payment systems that can bypass the dollar, right? So they can escape this kind of U.S. stranglehold on the global market. Right? So there are costs, what I'm trying to say is there are costs involved to trying to either export, use US, use, US, use U.S. economic power to impose its will either in terms of geopolitics with the dollar or with tariffs in terms of trade um, in order to protect U.S. workers. There's a much easier route, which I would like to see uh, the United States adopt, um, and it's possible it could happen if there is a large enough democratic victory in November, namely, um, we preserve the gains of the post-World War II liberalized trading system, but combine it with a much higher level of taxation that would allow the government to redistribute the gains from international trade and compensate the losers. What we've had going on in the United States since the Reagan Revolution is a double whammy to the working class in that globalization has undermined the security of their jobs on the one hand, and um, I guess conservative uh, market, pro-market policies domestically have destroyed the, uh, the, the welfare state internally, right? And so, yeah, you have cheap TVs, but education is unbelievably expensive. Healthcare is unbelievably expensive. Real estate is un 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 unbelievably expensive, right? So the most fundamental goods are outside of the reach of the average worker, and even, even professionals, right? Yeah. Where uh, uh, consumption goods are really cheap and abundant. It, it feels like the, the current administration is doing, if you look at the a two by two of, of what you just laid out, right? Like less, less fairness, and Lester's redistribution, more fairness, more redistribution, globalization versus nationalism. The, the current administration is going towards nationalism without fairness. And right. you want to go towards globalization, which is good for everybody in the long run, plus more redistribution and fairness. Yeah. The, the strategy of Trump and the Republican Party is to push back against globalization where the United States does not have a comparative advantage by using tariffs, right? and then imposing preferential trading terms on its trading partners where it does, and then instead of redistrib general redistributionist policy through, through something like the income tax, what they want to do is use tariffs to protect its friends, right? Yeah. So um, one thing that the tariff does is it allows the president, whoever he is, right, because imposing tariffs, is, as we've seen, really a matter of executive discretion, right? He can impose tariffs on those industries that support him. Yeah. So it's a great way to essentially buy power domestically, right? Because he's giving a signal, you know, if you support me, I'm going to protect you against foreign competition, right? So it's a really horrible way of running an economy if you if you believe in democracy and you believe in fairness, right? But in the short term, at least, it could be very effective, right? Have, have these policies, do you think, um, 
gotten, are they still kind of contained in the Trump mind or have they kind of permeated to the, like you said, the kind of the whole entire class, uh, whether it's just the Republicans or even beyond. And, and is that like a long-term risk even beyond Trump? Well, I think what Trump has done is that he's now made it acceptable to engage in these unilateral um, beggar thy neighbor trade policies. Whereas for 30 years, no, it was off the, it was not a part of respectable conversation, right? But what he did was show, oh, you can do it and you can get away with it because the United States is so strong, right? What I'm suggesting is that um, that's going to have negative consequences in the medium to long term for the United States because other countries can establish trading blocks to, to get enough you know, heft in the market to behave the same way. And internally, what it does is it allows the president to reward his enemies and punish his friends. Uh, excuse me, reward his friends and punish his enemies. Yeah. And that seems to be the theme, right? That seems to be a big theme of the uh, Trump presidency is is that uh, that that exact same thing, plus ma- normalizing just bad behavior. Yeah, and so what we would much prefer, and I would like to see Democrats embrace this openly, and I'm kind of little distressed that they're not, because they've kind of accepted protectionist logic and logic of bringing supply chain home, etc. What I would rather see is you know, pushing greater liberalization, um, pressuring China on human rights, and pushing forward a progressive tax agenda domestically uh, to help people who have been displaced by globalization, which is a serious problem. But the way to solve it is through redistribution, not through um, anti-competitive trade barriers, right? That just makes everybody worse off. And it gives too much discretion to the president to, you know, reward friends, punish enemies. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, it, do you do you think the, um, I mean, where we are today uh, in terms of the landscape, economic landscape, uh, lends itself to the same kind of rhetoric that we saw in 2016 from Trump, which, uh, I mean, resonated, right? I mean, by a slim margin, but n- nonetheless resonated especially in the Rust Belt in the United States. Um, do, do you think that we're still in that same place or does sort of COVID, whether it's the response of the administration, which is obviously, a, 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 you know, not necessarily a purely economic uh, conversation, but nonetheless has economic implications. Uh, does that sort of, if you, uh, if you excuse the word Trump, any conversations around the economy, et cetera? Well, I mean, the last question first, I definitely think COVID is going to dominate any other discussion. But I think economically, we're more or less in the same position. I mean, there was, of course, some some sectors benefited from tariffs. So steel manufacturers have benefited from tariffs. But consumers of steel, including automakers, have suffered, right? I mean, that's just the way tariffs work. Right. And so it's a it's it's always a question of, of, of picking winners and losers, and this is what was so awful about it is that I think the calculus on Trump's part was always about re-election, and so the tariff strategy was guided in large part by how do I benefit groups in particular states that would reward me by voting for me in 2020, right? Right. Um, and, 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 and I think that was a, sad to say, I think it was a kind of a winning strategy, but for COVID. I mean, not clear. I wasn't convinced that he was going to win anyway because so much of the country hates him. Mm-hmm. But what, what 2016 showed was you can have most of the country hate you and still win. Right. Yeah, and that's actually an interesting place to kind of pivot to talking about the Supreme Court, and I'll and I'll tell you kind of kind of what the bridge there is. So, just in like in the ec- economy, um, you had people who maybe weren't sure about uh, Trump, whether it's the Lindsey Grams or the people on the economic side. Sure, the the lower middle class has been not helped by Trump's policies, but if you look at the the upper class stock people who are invested in the stock market and whatnot, if they, if 
if what's that? The investor class. Investor class, yeah. Yeah, I was they, gonna say we need to move away from language, <laughs> upper, lower. Yeah. They they maybe were on the fence, but they're loving these the, the stock market again. I've seen people who hate everything about Trump, but they're they're like, well, he did get the stock market up. And similar and, and kind of what I'm getting at is the is the the parallel with the Christian community. I had friends in twenty sixteen, having gone to a Catholic school, some of my friends are you know, and from college were extremely conservative. They came from Idaho, Montana, and came to came to came to Gonzaga, which was like a big city at the time for them, relatively speaking. But they they were on the fence with Trump in 2016. But now they are adamant and convinced that he is good for Christians. Uh, and they say Obama was bad. This is their words, not mine. Obama was bad for Christians. His policies were, their words, anti-Christian. Uh, we they say we've become we being Christians have become an, one of the most oppressed minorities in the country. And Trump, on the other hand, has put in policies that are pro Christian, put in judges in the Supreme Court that are pro Christian, and helping us move from you know Obama's anti Christian policies. And we'll vote. Therefore, the proof is in the pudding. We may hate Trump, but we're going to vote for him because the 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 um, essentially the ends justify the means or results speak for themselves. I mean, I think beyond anecdotally, I, I think what you what you're sharing with from your friends or conversations you've had is something we've seen in general from the evangelical community, which is, you know, we're going to uh, uh, either give give Trump a complete pass on any sort of moral improprieties, indiscretions, um, because of the fact that he is going to pack the judiciary with conservative judges, um, you know, so. Uh, it, well, conservative, especially on social issues, which seems to be kind of where the conversations begin and end, in, in, uh, at least from what you hear um, from a rhetorical sense from the evangelical base. Um, and yeah, I, I agree. That is a good bridge or, a, con or a, a transition into the conversation we wanted to have with Professor Fuggle, which was around the Supreme Court um, and more in more in general, I should say, and then in more particular to talk about the, um, the um, 2020 um, docket that just in this session that just ended last month. Um, but I think, Omar, I think you you, you also beyond, or I, I guess, I, Professor Fuggle, um, did you have any sort of comments to make about maybe where you see the evangelicals being? Um, I mean, has Trump fulfilled the promises made with regards to the, the way the judiciary has sort of lined up? Well, I mean, let me just go back and just sure. a little more broadly about the question that Omar raised that, yeah, lots of people might hate Trump generally, but when it comes to the thing they most care about, the stock market, right, cultural issues, uh, they like him and so they're going to support him. Um, I mean, that, that may be true, right? Um, I think that that's a very, that reflects very poorly on the quality of American democracy if a, if, a, if a substantial segment of the population is going to support somebody solely based on the performance of the stock market, I mean, lots of things can affect the, the, the performance of the stock market that have nothing to do either with the quality of the economy or the quality of public life, right? I mean, I think everybody has come to the consensus that, you know, the stock market today is where it's at largely because of a flood of liquidity from the Federal Reserve. It has nothing to do with underlying fundamental performance of the economy, right? Now, secondly, if you are of a certain kind of conservative religious persuasion, um, you might believe that conceptions of civic equality are anti-religious because you're now being forced to except um, as at least civic equals, people whose beliefs, whose lifestyles, etc., you find loathsome, right? Um, now, I can understand why you could experience that as persecution, but, you know, as I think I've said before, you know, I've never heard of um, uh, Protestant evangelicals getting shot in the back as they're walking away from a policeman, right? It's just hard to imagine um, or equate uh, the legalization of same-sex marriage with persecution, 
religious persecution. We know what religious persecution looks like. Looks like. If you go to England, if you go to Oxford, you can see places where people were burned at the stake for being Protestant or something, or the reverse, or I, I can't w say whatever. That is not happening in the United States, right? Uh, liberals are not burning Christians. They aren't throwing them in jail. They aren't punishing them. They aren't firing them from jobs because they hold the wrong theological doctrine. What's happened is that everybody is required to accept as civic equals people with, with whom they profoundly disagree, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's not oppression that's just living with the, the reality of pluralism in american society right that's just not oppression um you might feel it experience it as a loss of privilege that may be that very well may be true right you can no longer take it for granted that everybody holds the same views that you have with respect to sexuality theology etc 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 but that's true for everybody in society it's not just true for you Right, okay. um, so it's it's just not oppression, right? It's loss of privilege, um, and now, as a from a practical perspective, I think evangelicals have a lot to thank Trump for. I mean, I think Trump did sort of come through with them for them, at least in regard to judicial appointments. So he has been very ideological. I mean, I don't think it's he, him personally, but he has allowed the most conservative elements within uh, the Republican Party to pick all his judges for him, right? Yeah. It's not that he has any conviction. The, the thing is, he has no convictions. So he's happy to do anything he needs to do as long as they agree to butter his bread, right? He doesn't care. That's right. So he, because he has no independent view about what the Constitution means, what it should be, what a, what a good society should look like, all he cares about is, you know, who's going to support me? I'll do whatever it takes. If they want me to support judges who will, you know, punish homosexuals, who will punish non-Christians, who will do this, do that, restore Christian privilege, I don't care. Sure, let's go for it, right? Um, so that's what makes Trump particularly dangerous, is that he's willing to strike any kind of bargain with any kind of constituency group that will keep him in power. So on one hand, you you do have um, on one hand you have a couple of the of, uh, of the justices uh, Gorsuch, Roberts, in some cases picking with the so-called uh, liberal side. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of going against the idea that things are split down the middle. On the other hand, I, having you know having not a legal background or anything like that, um, but just you know, your your basic education in high school level and college level at um, about how things are supposed to be from the government, right? The judicial branch is supposed to be neutral and not partisan. So on one hand, you have some of the judges going to the other side in some cases, but on the other hand, I've never heard more than you hear today that there's a conservative block and a liberal block, right? Is that, and I think I heard you say in the, in the last podcast that that really just started since the late Nixon years. Is that the new normal? Are we ever going to get back to a point where the, the nine justices aren't labeled as conservative or liberal? Um, is that even necessary or a good thing we should be targeting? Or is it, it's just, is it just a dangerous new normal? Um, I think it really depends on the nature of the questions that are being presented before the, the judges, before the court. Um, the most controversial questions are those questions uh, for which there is really no clear answer in terms of the Constitution or the relevant statute. Um, you know, where, 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 where the Constitution or the statute does give a clear answer, you're going to get unanimity. Or for the most part, you're not going to even have a lawsuit, right? But lots of the issues that are so divisive today are a result of the fact that the relevant constitutional standard is just that, a standard. It's, it's vague, it's abstract, it requires um, interpretation in specific cases, right? And so in those circumstances, it's going to make a difference, the personal commitments of the, of the justice. There's just no way to avoid that. So as our society becomes more and more pluralist and as the, the, the 
sphere in which the government interferes becomes more and more, you know, becomes wider and wider and more pervasive, it's inevitable, I think, in my opinion, that you're going to have more and more divisive opinions regarding open textured provisions such as uh, free exercise, the Establishment Clause, due process, all, all of these things, these fundamental rights litigations, right, where oftentimes you have um, two, you could say, plausible interpretations of how it should come out, right? Um, and so there's no, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that there will be unanimity on those issues. Um, so we have to learn to deal with these kinds of divisions one way or the other. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, b before Omar jumped in with his question, um, or um, yeah, I, going back to a comment or some of the comments you were making prior to that about evangelicals um, and, and, and the idea of a particular swath of the population feeling as though they are being uh, prosecuted, um, sorry, excuse me, persecuted. <laughs> um, I was getting ahead of myself talking about the Supreme Court. Um, I, I, I think that conversation can no longer be limited just to, uh, you know, Christian conservatives. And I think that, uh, which is where I think the, the conversation will also be especially meaningful to our Muslim listeners, which are probably the majority, which is, you know, you have these same conversations happening among like Muslim uh, circles. Uh, you've got, I'm beginning to see, uh, especially in Perhaps I was oblivious to it or less, it was less strident as it is now during the Bush years. But, you know, during the Trump years, what I am seeing is the kind of polarization even in the Muslim community, uh, especially with regards to these sort of social, these quote unquote social issues. Um, and, and, and like evangelicals have chosen um, abortion and, and, and I issues around, uh, you know, uh, contraception and, uh, you know, uh, uh, pro-life and whatnot conversations for Muslims, it's become the issue of, uh, gay rights and transgendered rights. And I think that, uh, you know, what we, one of the cases that I did want to discuss with you today was certainly the Bostock, uh, opinion and, 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 and we'll get to that. But I mean, I, I think the conversation that you were having, uh, Professor Fadl, I, I think can be broadened and, and, and can be inclusive of the kind of conversations we're seeing in the Muslim community as well among so-called conservatives and liberals, um, because I think whether, and, and I don't know if you want to necessarily characterize that as a matter of loss of privilege, like you said, with regards to sort of Christians feeling as though they're being persecuted. Um, I, I think it's a little bit different, right? With, with Muslims sort of feeling as though, not necessarily a feeling of of a loss of privilege as much as it is um, kind of, okay, what is the sort of direction or the moral, the moral compass of uh, society and, 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 and sort of how do we deal with that? Right. I mean, I think, so could you maybe broaden the conversation a little bit um, as you include the kind of conversations that you, I know are a part of in the Muslim community. I mean, I'm just yeah. following you on Twitter and so on. Right. I mean, I think there are, of course, these issues play themselves out in the Muslim community too. Mm -hmm. like Muslims, obviously, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys, uh, Islam has very clear teachings on what appropriate sexual expression is and what inappropriate sexual expression is. Um, and so I think many people in our community have a lot of anxiety over what this kind of pluralism in the public sphere means for our community that wants to maintain a certain kind of moral coherence with respect to its internal sexual t internal teachings about appropriate sexuality right? that's right and you know to a certain extent it's a lot easier to maintain the integrity of those doctrines religious doctrines if they are kindly widely widely held as default social norms by everybody even if those people don't have genuine religious motivations for upholding them Right, um, And so again, what I would tell Muslims is sort of what I would tell Christians is that we live in a, from a, in a, civic, from a civic perspective, a pluralist society. We don't all share the same uh, theological values, the same moral values, right? And we just have to learn to accept that. Um, we can't expect the government 
to use coercive power to discipline those people who have different conceptions of morality and truth. We just can't do that, right? Um, that's the price for being in a liberal democratic society. So yes, it makes it harder for us. We have to do a better job of teaching our children what we believe in, why we believe in it, as opposed to just relying on like visceral hatred, for example. Right. Okay. This is actually this conversation is really resonating, right? Because so I think I, a lot of yeah. Muslims who are opposed to these decisions, they want to be able to rely on visceral hatred of things like homosexuality, transgenderism, in order to avoid the difficult task of actual moral and ethical instruction of the community. Mm. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you nailed it. And this is like I said, this really resonates because I grew up in. Uh, eastern Washington Idaho border area where everybody was most people were Christian um, the most the most kind of uh, unifying uh, yeah no I was going to say like the the quote-unquote bad kids <laughs> at school in high school were like would be saints compared to uh, you know kids today uh, I didn't know it at the time but you know in the sense that the worst thing they were doing was maybe having a cigarette I mean there's not much going on in my high school. They're all good Christians. A lot of them were, you know, went to Mormon, uh, uh, Mormon uh, missions after high school. Many, many folks got married right after uh, college, like immediately the summer afterwards and so forth. Whereas living in the Silicon Valley, my kid, my kids, it's very different. Um, my kids have transgender uh, classmates and friends and so on and so forth. Right. Just to give you kind of the, the difference, but like pro the professor said, it's, it's it's harder as a parent to really, um, you know, inst instruct your kids as to uh, how you want them to live from an Islamic point of view. So the out the outsourced parenting <laughs> doesn't work anymore, right? You have to really like own it. Uh, so I'd I'd love to get even a little more into this conversation, um, you know, because it's it's really interesting, definitely resonating for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's really the the, the issue is that we as a community. Um, I mean, I've, I've long, I've had long standing frustrations with um, religious education in the Muslim community. Um, I've always felt that it's more about identity formation yes. um, than actual true education. When I mean true education, I mean giving young Muslims and adult Muslims the ability to engage with their religion as mature adults, mature thinkers, be able to ask questions, be able to learn, to be able to grow spiritually over time. I, you know, my, my great, you know, my, my perception that most Islamic education is really about creating a certain kind of conformist behavior. And there's no real concern or no real attempt at genuine intellectual character formation. And so that's very problematic in a liberal, pluralistic society because you just can't control people, right? Um, people have got to be able to affirm their own values, live, live their values because they have um, a conviction, they have a connection to them, they understand why they're living the way they're living, they want to live the way they're living, right? And it's not as though I don't think we're incapable of doing that. I think we are, right? It's just that, you know, we haven't done so. And that should really be our priority. Instead of complaining about the kind of pluralism that exists in society, which, as I said, you're not going to be able to get rid of. What you, what you do have control over is your own education, I mean, your, your community's own educational resources, the, your, your own institutions, right? Um, and you can work on making those better. You can work on giving people a more mature um, Islamic education. You can give them the tools to be able to live as democratic citizens in a pluralistic society while being faithful Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, but that requires, a, I think, a, a really dramatic reorientation and the way we teach Islam to our kids, and the way we teach it even to adults, and the way it's preached, um, sermons, etc. Um, you know, and so that's a that's a huge challenge, right? It is. So in that way, yeah. from that perspective, again, 
just like kind of Christian evangelicals, I think they kind of thought they were always entitled to rely on general culture to do the hard work for them. That's you right. can't do that, right? right? That's the whole point of, of, of Hindu uh, kind of theocratic, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, state instrument. So, 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 you know, I, I think that the, a lot of what you're saying resonates because I mean, the conversations that Indian Muslims are having is while well, you know decrying the loss of secular democracy, right? Which is almost sort of contradictory to the conversation that we're having right now here in the United States because it's almost as though we don't appreciate the frame that a, a liberal democracy or a secular democracy provides. Um. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't compare what's going on in the United States to India. I mean, again, India, I think, is much, 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 much worse. Of course, I didn't mean to, right. It's not, you know, I, I don't know enough about Hinduism to con comment on a Hindu theocracy, but it looks more to me like just Hindu chauvinism mm -hmm. as opposed to anything else. Um, but again, the point, I, what I want to emphasize is, is it, it, I go back to again, is that in a liberal democracy, you aren't entitled to use the power of the state to punish those who live in a way different than yourself, mm -hmm. right? Simply because you think it's immoral. That that's just that's full stop. That you can't uh, you can't be advocating that, right? Mm -hmm. Even aside from the strategic foolishness of such a position, because we would be on the receiving end of it, you know, ninety nine percent of the time. Um, so what that means is that given that reality, we need to adopt a certain kind of Islamic education that is appropriate for Muslims as liberal citizens. And I think that's where our greatest failure is. It's a challenge. It's easier to wish for a time in which there was a kind of, you know, um, when there was actual persecution of, of these groups, um, but, you know, that would mean also that you are persecuted, first of all, and uh, second of all, I, I don't know to what extent the persecution of, of, of homosexuals, etc., is even consistent with most conceptions of Islamic concepts of privacy, etc., right? I mean, um, whatever our religion teaches about these things, it certainly also teaches that we're not supposed to be going around trying to find out what people are doing in the privacy of their homes and punishing them, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, it's not as though the status quo ante was particularly appealing to us either, and so we shouldn't be romanticizing it or thinking of it as some sort of loss that we should pine over. Yeah, Inter uh, interesting. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that uh, we don't hear often about the the the, the value of, of privacy in the Islamic tradition. That's something we uh, you you just mentioned that we just don't hear often enough. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I think we've kind of teased it enough, but I mean, I think maybe kind of uh, shifting the conversation into not only the. Um, the uh, session, the Supreme Court session that just ended, but I think in particular, if we could begin with kind of talking about, because again, I think we've kind of teased it or skirted around the issue uh, without naming it, um, uh, uh, which is the kind of relevant conversations that the, that the court is having or, or that the court had uh, in the Bostock case. So um, it, I, I don't know if you wanted to, how you wanted to kind of get into the, the conversation in particular, Professor Fabo, but uh, maybe giving us a little bit of the background of the case and uh, what I found interesting. Well, I, you know what, I'll let you do that and then I'll kind of tease some well, other parts of it that I wanted to also discuss with you. I think it's very hard for people to understand the importance of Title VII, which is the federal anti-discrimination law in employment, without understanding the basic background norm of U.S. employment law, which is what's known as at-will employment. That means that unless you have a written contract, that provides specific